We're talking about how we can use finite difference methods to solve parabolic partial differential equations. In the previous video, I reminded you of some of the properties of parabolic partial differential equations. And we introduced the model problem that we're going to be looking at, which is the 1D unsteady diffusion equation. I also introduced the idea of these marching methods that we'll be using to solve these parabolic equations in the form of explicit and implicit techniques. And in this video, we're going to look at explicit methods namely the first order explicit or Euler method, Richardson method, and the dufort frankel methods. So remember that explicit methods only have one unknown. All of the other terms in the equation are known typically from the previous time step. So how do we get such an equation? Well, we take the spatial derivatives, we have temporal and spatial derivatives, we take the spatial derivatives and those are evaluated at the previous time level. So any partial partial x's or partial squared partial x squareds will be evaluated at the previous time level for which we already know the solution and in that way we'll only have one single unknown at the current time level. So the shorthand that we're going to use is u sub i, the subscript i will indicate the x location and superscript n or n plus 1 will put in parentheses just emphasize that this is not a power of u that is going to indicate the time step. So u sub i n plus 1 means u evaluated at x sub i, that's the x location, and at the n plus first time step, t sub n plus 1. You'll remember that in elliptic equations, the superscript indicated the iteration number, not the time step. So we're using the same notation here now to mean the time step rather than the iteration number. So the first order explicit method, it's also known as the Euler method, because it was developed many years ago by Leonard Euler, long before digital computers, so yeah, that means people used to do this by hand. So remember we have our x spatial dimension and time up. And then we're going to march the solution forward from the initial condition at t is equal to zero. And then we'll march delta t, delta t, delta t. And so a generic time step will be the nth time step. And then the very next one, a delta t away, will be the n plus first time step. Our spatial domain will be discretized just as we did in the boundary value problem, elliptic partial differential case, starting with i is equal to 1, then 2, up to capital I plus 1. So we have capital I intervals with capital I plus 1 grid points. If we zoom in on this generic location, i, n, and n plus 1, we can blow it up and it looks like this. So we have the nth time level, that's the previous time level for which we already know the solution. And then we're seeking the solution at the next time level, a delta t away, that's the n plus first time level. We have our i, i plus 1, and i minus 1 points. So those are each a delta x away. I won't show this overall picture anymore. I'm just going to show the zoomed in pictures for the later methods. But what I'll clearly indicate on each of these schematics is the x marks the spot. Where is the equation actually being approximated? And if I forget to put the x on, you'll remind me. I'm sure you will. So x marks the spot is here. So I'm approximated at the previous time level. So what that means for the time derivative is that if I approximate partial u partial t here, the only way to pick up the next point at the next time level is by using a first order accurate forward difference approximation for the time derivative. So partial u partial t will be ui n plus 1. That's this point right here minus uin, that's this point right here, divided by the distance between them, delta t. Now remember, that's only order delta t. It's only first order accurate in time. So that's a forward difference approximation from the previous time level to the current time level. Now one thing you're going to notice in these is if you just look at this approximation, you actually can't tell that this is a forward difference approximation it very easily could be a backward difference approximation. There's no way to tell just by looking at this equation. You need to clearly define where you're approximating the equation. So just keep that in mind. We'll see how that plays out in uh, future techniques as well. Then for the spatial derivative, partial squared u partial x squared, remember we have partial u, partial t is equal to alpha partial squared u partial x squared. So the second derivative term in x is going to be approximated using a second order accurate central difference approximation as we've been using all along. So it's second order accurate in space. It's ui plus 1 minus 2ui plus ui minus 1 over delta x squared. And all of these are approximated at the nth at the previous time level. 
because that's where we know the solution. So when you put in partial u partial t is equal to alpha times partial squared u partial x squared, this is what we get. And you'll notice there's only one unknown. There's only one value in this equation that we do not know. That's the ui n plus one. All of these other terms are evaluated at the previous time level where we already know the solution. So as we usually do, put the unknowns on the left, put the knowns on the right. There is only one unknown. So this is an explicit expression, thus first order explicit method, because it's only first order accurate. Then on the right, we have all values of u from that previous time step. This alpha delta t delta x squared, we're going to call that s, just to make our lives a little bit simpler. So I can combine these terms. Here's a uin, uin term. So I can simplify this a bit to uin plus 1 is equal to the quantity 1 minus 2s. Remember, that's alpha delta t over delta x squared times uin plus s times the sum of the other two points, ui plus 1 plus ui minus 1, both at the previous time level. And then we apply this at every point along the x coordinate as we march from time step to time step to time step. So again, explicit expression, only one unknown, and we just go from point to point to point to point to point at the current time step, updating their values, ui and plus one, as we go. Once we're finished, we then increment the time step and move forward as such. Once again, this is an explicit equation for ui n plus one. That's the only unknown. It requires us to sweep along all the values of i for each time step. The method is second order accurate in space, because we used a second order accurate central difference for the second derivative in x, but it's only first order accurate in time. So we call it the first order explicit method. One thing you'll notice is that you could adjust the time step delta t as you go. So I could be tracking the solution and I could say, well, it looks like the solution is changing a lot from one time step to the next. So maybe the next time step will take a smaller delta t. So it's very straightforward to accommodate that, to adapt your time step to the solution as you go. There are restrictions on the time step and the grid size delta x for this first order explicit method. We say that the method is conditionally stable. Now we're talking about numerical stability here. We'll talk about in the next video how we evaluate numerical stability. For now, I'm just gonna give you the result. We'll talk about how we get this result later on. So it's conditionally stable. So it's only stable under certain conditions. The conditions are that s, which is the alpha delta t over delta x squared, has to be less than or equal to a half in order for the solution to be stable. Now this is very restrictive. Okay, now what does it mean for a numerical method to be unstable? As we do the calculation at each time step, we're introducing round off errors. These are like tiny little perturbations in the system, in the solution. The question is, what does the numerical algorithm do with those tiny little perturbations? If they grow, then the method is unstable. If they do not grow, or if they decay, then it is stable. In order for it to be stable, s has to be less than or equal to a half. So effectively what that means is, once you choose your grid size, delta x, this limitation determines the delta t that you need to choose in order to maintain a stable numerical solution as you march forward in time. So in choosing the time step then, we have actually two considerations. You always have to be concerned with whether the time step is sufficiently small to give you an accurate temporal solution, that the approximate solution that you obtain in time is accurate, is faithful to the actual solution of the differential equation. That's always a concern, that's always a consideration. But we also have a secondary consideration, and that is, is my time step small enough in order to maintain numerical stability. Typically for explicit methods, that second requirement for numerical stability is more stringent, more restrictive than the first requirement for numerical accuracy. So this is gonna be very restrictive and we're gonna to need to develop methods, namely implicit methods, that help mitigate these numerical stability issues. So we have two issues here. There's the numerical stability issue. There's also the fact that it's only first order accurate in time. For now, let's think about how could we increase the temporal accuracy of the scheme? How can we restore second order accuracy in time? Well, one technique would be Richardson's method. So the idea behind Richardson's method is very simple. We know that central difference approximations are second order accurate. So if we could develop a time marching scheme that use central differences in time 
in addition to the central differences in space, then we get back our second order accuracy. So this is how it looks. So here is the next time level for which we want to get the solution. Here's the previous time level that we already know the solution. And here's the next previous time level, the n minus first time level, at which we also know the solution because we're marching delta t, delta t forward in time. So these two we know. Now we're going to approximate the solution at that same location at the i, n location in the grid, but we're now going to use a second order accurate central difference in time. So you see that here, u i n plus one minus u i n minus one. So this point minus this point divided by the distance between them, that's two delta t. So that now that's second order accurate. And then the right hand side is exactly as before. Same second order accurate central difference approximation to the second derivative in x. So now both temporally and spatially, we have second order accuracy. Once again, we only have one unknown, that's the uin plus one. Solve for that, put all the knowns on the right hand side, and that's what you get. And that's fine, that's no more difficult than using the first order explicit method. And you might be asking, well, why don't I hear too much about the Richardson method? Well, it's because it turns out to be unconditionally unstable. In other words, there are no values of s for which it is numerically stable. So we do not use the Richardson method for these types of problems. However, it does suggest a route to getting second order accuracy in both space and time. You'll also notice that you have to keep your delta t constant because these delta t's have to be the same in order for my x marks the spot to be exactly in the middle of the previous and next time step. Okay, well we still want second order accuracy in time, so what can we do? So the Richardson method gets a second order accuracy, but it's unconditionally unstable. Can we alter this such that we get back numerical stability, at least conditional numerical stability? So let's go all the way back to when we first talked about finite differences. Remember we said they were based on Taylor series approximations. Let's take a look at the seri Taylor series approximation at Tn plus one about Tn. So that would be Uin plus one is equal to Uin and then our additional terms in the Taylor series that take into account the distance between them, delta t, and then derivatives, first derivative, second derivative, and so forth, evaluated at the point at which we're approximating function. Similarly, if we write the Taylor series for tn minus one about tn, then it's uin minus one is equal to uin, and then minus delta t, because we're going backwards in time, times the first derivative plus delta t squared is over two times the second derivative. Now why am I doing this? Well, if we add these two Taylor series together, add these two expressions together, I'll have uin plus one plus uin minus one. Then I'll have two of the uins right here. And then these terms cancel because one is positive and one is negative. And then the next term, add those together, and you get delta t squared times partial squared u partial t squared evaluated at i, at the nth time level. So why do I do this? So if we solve for u i n, which is exactly halfway between u i n minus one and u i n plus one, then this tells us that the average of those two values, that that will give you an approximation for the value in the middle, makes sense, that's intuitive, but now we know the accuracy. It is second order accurate in time. The idea here is that if I truncate all of these terms, the truncation error of this approximation, this averaging, is second order accurate. So it's no worse than the second order accuracy that's inherent in the Richardson method. So here's the idea. If I go back to the Richardson method, and where I have this uin, if I instead substitute this expression the average of the surrounding points before and after, that's what you see here. If I then solve that for the uin plus one as we did before, you still have just one unknown. It's an explicit expression with all the stuff on the right hand side that you now know. So now we've maintained second order accuracy in time. And now the question is, have we helped or hurt the numerical stability? It turns out there's a new problem. The new issue we have here is consistency. You'll remember many, many videos ago, we talked about various desirable properties, necessary properties actually, of numerical methods. One is that they be consistent. Consistency means if I take the finite difference form of an equation, 
and I take the limit as delta x, and in this case delta t goes to zero, it should return back to the continuous differential equation that we started with. So it's consistent. So if we check that, I can take my equation partial u partial t minus alpha partial squared u partial x squared. So in this form on the right hand side I've written down what we get from Richardson method which we just discussed a moment ago. Remember for Dufort Frankel we substitute in for u i n, we substitute in this average of the two surrounding values before and after. If I do that I then have the three terms that are being truncated. I have this term, which I represented here, this term represented here, and then I also have the truncation error term from this time averaging, and that's this one right here. You can remember that from back here. All right, so now we have these three terms, which for it to be consistent, for this numerical method to be consistent, as delta x and delta t goes to zero, all of these terms must vanish. So, because if they do, then we get back to the original differential equation that we started with. Well, this is fine. As delta t goes to zero, that term goes away. As delta x goes to zero, that term goes away. But you notice here I have a delta t squared over a delta x squared. So does this go to zero? And the answer is, well, it depends. Does delta t go to zero faster than delta x? If so, then it does vanish. But if delta x is smaller than delta t, then this term actually blows up. So this is what we call an inconsistent scheme. Feel bad for Dufort and frankly get your name put on a scheme that is never used because it's inconsistent. But I want to illustrate that here because it's not a property we discuss very frequently because I generally don't show you and introduce to you and, and teach you methods that are inconsistent because we don't use them. So here is an example of an inconsistent method. All right, so that's all discussed here. And again, the conclusion is that it's inconsistent. So it is second order accurate in both space and time. You do have to keep the delta t constant for the same reason that that's the case in Richardson's method. It turns out that it is unconditionally stable. So that means it's stable for all conditions. So any s, the problem is it's inconsistent. And therefore, again, we do not use it. So we've gone over three methods, first order explicit method, Richardson method, Dufort Frankel method. And it's only that first one that's actually useful to us. These other two, I just want to illustrate inconsistency and some of the issues that come up with stability as well. So in the next video, we'll talk about where do these numerical stability criteria come from? How do we get them? How do we derive them? We'll do that in the next video.